Hi, uh, my name is Barry Roth, and I'm active in uh, the local government as an ordinary citizen. I first moved here in the 1970s, and I found it to be a wonderful place. I had to leave to find work, but I moved back about 10 years ago, and as much as I loved it then, the Pioneer Valley, I love it even more now. It's a wonderful place. It's, it's a place blessed by God. And I think sometimes that we, we think that it's, it's our work, but in reality, it always was a beautiful place, and what we need to do is protect it and not allow it to become just another urban highway like the eastern seaboard. I don't think that will happen if citizens are heard. And my problem with this latest charter proposal is that it has a basic doubt about the wisdom of voters, a fundamental disbelief in the voters. But I think voters, they're very, very busy, and sometimes they may not make the right decisions. But if you include them and you allow them to be heard, in the end, when we do reach agreement, it will be the best, and the, and, and the future of Northampton will just move forward. So I'm going to talk about this proposed city charter and, and explain seven points as to why I feel it should be voted down. I'll present the positives of it as presented by its proponents, and I will express the reservations that maybe they're not prepared to discuss. I think the most salient point is the four-year term versus the two-year term. And they have good reasons for arguing for a four-year term. For one thing, it frees the mayor up from having to think about a campaign every two years. And that's a, that's a good thing. Another thing that they see is a good, uh, a good thing is it allows the mayor, whoever that may be, to carry out their vision without fear of being cut off before their plan is brought to fruition. That's also a good, a good reason. So I can understand people arguing that point. But the problem is, if you accept those points, then what you have to do is allow for the possibilities of bad things happening. Perhaps the mayor is wrong. Perhaps the mayor's vision isn't a good one. Perhaps the mayor isn't a good mayor. And I'm not getting into personalities here. David Narkowitz seems to me to be a good mayor and an honest guy. But what if, what if the mayor wasn't a good mayor? This charter has to, to consider that possibility, and it doesn't. This should be a means of having a recall provision, provision if you're going to extend the term for four years. Or there should be term limits if you're going to extend the, the uh, mayor's term for four years. That's just common sense. But this charter doesn't have it in there. And one of the reasons, and big reason that they don't have the recall provision in there, is because one of the committee members argued quite forcefully that the citizens of Northampton couldn't be trusted because they might, just out of spite, if their candidate lost, insist on having a recall vote. I don't think anybody who really knows the people of Northampton would believe that for a second. But that, you must understand, is the reason that there is no recall provision in there. Now, there's another thing. We have two-year terms for counselors. And I think that's a good thing. It's short. If you're not happy with your counselor, you have an opportunity every two years to vote them out. And in theory, if somebody supports the mayor, it's, it's like the mayor's, the mayor's uh, city councilor, then you could, in theory, vote them out. That's, that's the positive view of it. But once again, what it doesn't consider is the negative view. And the negative view, the negative reality is, well, just look at the previous election. David Narkowitz was virtually hand-picked by the pre previous mayor, Claire Higgins. She said she wanted him. She, she put him in office for a little while. That may be politics, but do you want your charter to put that in place? I don't think so. And that hasn't been discussed. A third point is that the mayor no longer attends city council meetings. And once again, there's a good side to it, which, which they presented, but they haven't spoken about the bad side. The good thing about having the mayor no, no longer attends the city council, it does give the city council a greater freedom to discuss things. 
It doesn't have the mayor who's kind of controlling the city council. But what are the negatives of that? Well, it means if you want to speak to the mayor, you're going to go and have to speak to him in his office. And the reality is, you're not going to be able to. That is most of you. If you give $5,000 to his campaign, sure, you'll be able to get that appointment. You'll have lunch together. I've seen these large campaign donors having lunch with mayors. That's, that's the way it works. We all know that. But do we want to institutionalize that in the charter? I don't think so. If we had more time to discuss the charter, and I don't know what the rush is, then what would have happened is we could have talked about having the mayor come before city council every two months or three months where you could ask him questions directly and he would have to answer. You know, there's no limitation on what the charter, how, what form it will take. Your imagination and your sense of fairness is the only limitation. So that's a possibility that never got discussed because you weren't allowed to speak and get your input, inputs into these meetings. It was all done presto. Now there's something that I was very heavily involved with and that is the right of petition. And specifically the right of an individual petition. It's guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. It's guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. But our city charter doesn't have it. That's right, our city charter does not have assure you the right to petition your government. When this was discussed within the city council, they said, uh, you, can, you can write up a note. But the point is, with the way our city works is legislation is drafted within committees and it comes up before the city council for a vote. And what happens is the city, the committee chairman does, writes the wording and he decides or she decides what literature gets put into that package. So that's the, why you, that's, that, that's the reason you'll see some of these city councils playing on their computer while all the discussion's going on. It's already been decided. What you have to say, they're not listening to you. And this would have, would have held them accountable. And there's good reason why they wouldn't want that, why they wouldn't trust the voters. Suppose you're, suppose you're a lawyer and you're representing a, a land developer. Would you really want someone writing up all the circumstances surrounding that and putting it on the record within the city council? I don't think so. Everybody has their special issues and they want to just have one viewpoint. That's what's going on in the country right now. That's the problem with it. You can't hear the other side. There is nothing in the charter right now that guarantees your right to be heard, believe it or not. We'll get to the right to speak before the city council as the last thing, city council. But fundamentally, you're not being heard. You feel that way, you sense it, and it's true. Now, I spoke about the right of an individual to petition, and there's also the right to a group petition. So what the, the, these councils and this committee that drafted this charter say, they say, well, look, you can always have a, a petition, but think about it. Suppose they want to build a land dump right next door to where you live. Well, if it's big enough to affect enough people, you may be able to get the 10% of the votes needed to get a petition going or 15% 15 of the elected voters to sign this sign the thing. But more often than not, what's, what's tr troubling you is a local matter that only matters to you and maybe a couple of neighbors. So this group petition thing, while it has some value, it doesn't really work for you in most cases. Think about the huge cases that took place before uh, uh, petitions and the amount of work. I know the people involved, uh, Bimi Yodgers, the huge amount of work and some of the other people, the, the effort that it took to finally close down the landfill. You don't want to go that route, and you shouldn't have to go that route to be heard. And that's a problem with the charter as it exists and it's going to exist. Now, I, I don't know anybody who saw last night's meeting uh, where we had the committee uh, say that the DPW uh, uh, will be reined in by the new charter and sewer rates. Um, that may or may not be the case. I was told by Gene Tacey that uh, originally that he very specifically 
didn't want to give the city council the right to rein in the rates of the DPW because it would put him in an awkward position of having to vote for tax increases. And he felt that that could jeopardize his, his election. And this isn't a knock on Gene Tacy because he's a very honest and hardworking guy. He's telling, he was saying like it was. He said it openly last night in the meeting. Now, this may have changed. It's not clear. Let's understand something. It isn't at all clear. It isn't a certainty that we will be able to re reign in the DPW. Let's hope that we can. Citizens sh absolutely should have, a, have the right to have a say over, uh, over how they're taxed. But the reason we're in this situation where we need to raise $100 million for our infrastructure, for our sewers, is because citizens' voices haven't been heard. Where was the DPW for the last 20 years? They're telling you this, they're telling you that. There were individuals speaking out, but their voices weren't heard. And that isn't going to change with this city charter. Finally, number, point number seven, speaking before city council. And I think, uh, I, think uh, I want to point out something. Uh, right now we have three minutes to speak in front of the city charter. It doesn't matter that the city councilors pretty much dismiss what's said before them. As I say, they've pretty much made up their mind based upon the notes and recommendations they received from committee. There may be exceptions, but the city charter wasn't one of them because the city charter was essentially presented to them by the committee and the city councils swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. They'll talk about this charter that's supposed to last for 100 years. They'll talk about how they debated it for a week or for three days or whatever it was. They stayed up late all night for a week or something. Whoa, come on, folks. This chart is going to last for 100 years. Think about it. The problem, the other thing you should realize is that this city charter doesn't guarantee you any length of time. And I will point out that right now when city council is um, uh, deliberating on, on, on things, what they frequently do, I don't think they're legally supposed to be doing this. And again, uh, it's just a matter of, of abuse of power, in my opinion. But they take two votes. I, I believe the state constitution, and I could be wrong, requires two votes to be taken on, on laws. I'm sure the city charter does. And the reason they have that is so that the residents' voices can be heard. You take the first vote, and then citizens get to think about what was said and learn about it. And then like at the next city council meeting, which should be two weeks away or a month away, whatever, people will have had a chance to hear about it, think about it, and come back to the city council and express their opinion. But that's not the way our city council works anymore. In fact, with this city charter and bringing it up for vote, I think, ag I, 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 again, I'm not certain of this, but I think they took two votes on, within one meeting in a space of 15 minutes. They said, oh, oh, oh who's for uh, you know, putting, the, putting, putting it out for a vote or whatever? I, OK, five minutes later, OK, who's for putting, let's take our, take, take our second vote. Hey, come on, guys. Uh-uh. That doesn't wash. So I think when I heard other people speak at the one meeting that we had just, just a week or so ago, they basically said, what's the rush? I mean, someone said that therefore the charter, the government works great. They trust the, the government. But my question would be, if the government works so great, then what's the rush to change it? These are huge, huge ramifications. When this goes in place, your voice is going to be diminished. You're going to have a much more difficult time being heard. And that's a bad thing. There's no rush for it. So I probably could go back over some, some of these points in more detail. But I think I should have given, said enough that you have reason to have pause. If you see some compelling reason to have passed this charter now, then you should vote yes for it. But I don't see any compelling reason. I think we've seen a lot of bad things happen in this city. I live near Cardinal Way, and frankly, it is a disgrace. It's what, part of what propels me here. Every day I had passed by, they built a bridge and a large complex over what was a beautiful beaver uh, pond with frogs and turtles. It was, it was beautiful. And when I pass by that now, it's a death trap. Every day, crushed turtles, crushed frogs. There's no excuse for that, not in an educated city like this. But that happens when the voices of the citizens are blocked. So I guess I finally had a chance to speak in a series 
and present what my objections were. It's hard to believe that it was a year ago that I tried to express some of these views, and it's taken a year before I found an opportunity to express it. And when all is said and done, even for, uh, to these citizens who are so active in government and with whom I vigorously disagree, I thank them for the work they've done. I think they believe in what they're doing. But they're wrong. You know that. I know that. People, the real people know that. Vote no on the charter.